I'm going to try to put a little bit of meat on the bones of what all of you guys already know, because obviously you have to be living under a rock not to be following, at least in broad contours, what's happening with regard to Russia um, and Ukraine and sort of what's coming next. Um, let me sort of just walk through some of the paces to get sort of get rid of the conventional wisdom and then talk about sort of what the, the internal dynamics are as I see them. Um, I say this advisedly. Uh, Frank mentioned my, my latest book uh, called Implosion, the End of Russia and What It Means for America. Uh, the title is what happens when you let an overzealous publisher sort of get carried away, get their media department carried away. So it's, it's about the end of Russia as we know it, because it's all about economics, all about demographics, which I'll talk about in a second. It's not about the fact that Russia is going out of business. In fact, Ukraine is a great example of how the Russians are trying very hard not to go out of business. So l let me sort of uh, contextualize for you guys what this means. So first of all, um, one of the most astounding things uh, that, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm repeatedly on a number of issues uh, shocked by it, but I'm, uh, I was particularly shocked by it in this context, was the fact that the mainstream media, sort of the mainstream consensus on Russia and Russia's propensity to expand was so categorically wrong. There's a great piece by Eli Lake in the Daily Beast, literally two hours before Russia and sort of troops into Ukraine, in which he said that oh, all these interviews that I had with the intelligence community, they said, oh, Putin's bluffing. Nothing's going to happen. It, it had to set some sort of lane speed record for debunking conventional analysis. But there you have it. Um, and you saw the same sort of the same information, erroneous information, filter out into the mainstream media. Fareed Zakaria uh, was, would, would opine on CNN all the time about how, you know, this is essentially a, a whole lot, much ado about nothing. Um, the reality is, though, uh, for those people, and, and I know a number of you do, follow this uh, fairly rigorously and fairly religiously, is that the writing has been on the wall for some time. First of all, Vladimir Putin ideologically is fully committed, I think we can all be clear now, uh, in the concept of a greater Russia. Uh, he has talked publicly about the collapse of the Soviet Union being the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. I might nominate some other candidates, but that's, that's sort of that's what, what he chose uh, <clears throat> to harp on when he talked uh, about that in Munich in 2005. And what he's done is he's built a sort of a, a, a neo-Soviet empire of influence. This isn't Russian troops necessarily rolling across the border the way you see in Ukraine all the time, but it certainly is uh, a series of constructs in economic terms and in security terms that are intended to sort of to bolt the former parts of the Soviet Union back to Moscow in a pretty organic way. Um, the whole current uh, crisis over Ukraine was, was uh, built around precisely that. Um, the Ukrainian government, the former Ukrainian government, had for all of its corruption been on track to sign an association agreement with the European Union. Um, and in doing so, it would have made a clear choice between Europe on the one hand and something called the Eurasian Union on the other hand. This is Putin's alternative, uh, economically unsound uh, variant of the EU. And Putin wasn't having any of it. And so he essentially gave uh, the former Ukrainian president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, an offer he couldn't refuse uh, to the tune of $15 billion. Yanukovych reversed course. The people came out in the street um, in, in, Ukraine, in Kiev's Maidan Square, and sort of the end is history. But... Um, but this is, I think, driven very much by ideology, and it's an ideology that um, is empowered by this, this old Russian saying that the appetite comes from the eating. And so the, fir the more Putin fails to meet resistance in his push to reclaim parts of the uh, former Soviet Union, the more he's likely to be emboldened. There's also a sort of a distinctly domestic component to all this, because Putin is the only game in town in, in Russian, in contemporary Russian political terms. But that doesn't mean that he's overwhelmingly popular. There's a, there's a, watching polls in Russia is a little bit of a tricky enterprise because Russia has essentially jury rigged its entire media and polling apparatus. So they have uh, institutions that are varying degrees of unfree. But of those, some of the least corrupted, at least so far, are organizations like uh, the Levada Center out of Moscow. And their most recent polling suggests that Putin is popular for now for a whole bunch of reasons. But as you move further into the future, more and more Russians want the country to take not only a course sort of uh, away from him as a person, but a course away from his policies. Um, and this is a pretty, I think, signal, uh, pretty important signal to the Russian government itself because it is presiding over an increasingly sluggish, uncompetitive economy. Um, and, you know, all politics ultimately is local, and uh, Putin sees the seizure of Ukrainian territory as uh, a very important bolstering point, at least temporarily, uh, 
for his popularity at home. He's, he's essentially carrying out in practice what a lot of Russians on the left and the right of the Russian political spectrum believe in theory, which is that Ukraine's sovereignty is malleable, Ukraine is a state at the sufferance of Moscow, and Moscow has now decided that it's time for the chickens to come home to roost. Um, there's also a demographic question, which is, I think is useful, uh, at least to, sort of to, to pick upon. Russia, in a real sense, is dying. Uh, Russia is a country that spans nine time zones. They have a population of 142 million people, uh, less than half that of the United States. And they are losing three uh, 300,000 people uh, to death and about 150,000 more to emigration every year. It's almost half a million people. And there's all sorts of drivers for that decline, um, a sky-high rate of abortion, a uh, collapse of the Russian family. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, uh, sort of socio, uh, socioeconomic uh, triggers that uh, people like Nick Eberstadt at AEI or uh, Murray Feshbach um, at the Woodrow Wilson Center have really delved into uh, in earnest. But the reality is that Russia, as a Slavic nation, is rapidly going out of business. And so the imperial Ill impulse that Russia has to reclaim lost lands is being spurred in a very real sense by the fact that they're running out of Slavs, of Slavic Russians. And they need to reconstitute the, the human demographic base um, because they're feeling encroachment from the east in the form of China. They're feeling encroachment from the north and the center in the form of Russia's Muslim minority, which is expanding, but it's also radicalizing. So I wouldn't say this is the primary driver of what's happening in Ukraine, but it's certainly not, uh, hasn't escaped the notice of uh, the Russian government that the uh, that Ukraine's particularly the parts of Ukraine that are um, pro-Russian and Slavic are which which is most of them uh, most of them are Slavic uh, not all of them uh, in fact not even a majority are pro-Russian but nonetheless adding those to the rump aggregate of uh, the population of the Russian Federation would not be a bad thing um, and remember also that there's a historical precedent for what Putin's done. Uh, Putin invaded Georgia in 2008, and Putin did so in a way that has essentially enshrined the pro-Russian direction of the breakaway provinces of Abkhazia and South Ossetia into perpetuity. He did it essentially legalistically. These regions were allowed a fair degree of autonomy from the Georgian government um, before uh, the Russian invasion, but what has been enshrined and uh, essentially solidified by persistent Russian military presence has been that these are autonomous regions, that they have a constitution which is at variance with the, the Georgian state. And that's precisely what's beginning to happen in, in the Crimean Peninsula, where the Russians have invaded. We are on the cusp of a, <clears throat> of a referendum. We're about a, a day and a half out um, from a referendum um, in Crimea, which, given the demographics, given the sort of the news coming out of Crimea, is going to fold solidly in favor of Crimea voting to accede to the Russian Federation. Um, the, the legal groundwork has already been laid. Um, there, you know, there are rallies, uh, some of them spontaneous, surely, but some of them almost equally surely organized by the Kremlin in support of Crimean accession to the Russian Federation. The head of the uh, Russian government's uh, upper chamber of parliament called the Federation Council has essentially said that um, they've already laid the legal groundwork for accepting Crimea as an equal subject of the Russian Federation. Um, and what's going to happen is, and you, you, I'm sure, have heard the news about the Russian troops massing on Ukraine's border. I, my sense is, uh, and I may be wrong, but this is intended as a, uh, as a sort of a fail-safe in the aftermath of the referendum. Because I, my sense is what's going to happen is the, the Crimean parliament, the local regional parliament, is going to vote in favor of uh, joining the Russian Federation. The Ukrainian central government, the new Ukrainian central government, is going to say, no way, no how, and the Russians are going to, if they're going to make a play, that would be the time in which they would, they would say that they were going to move uh, in favor of Crimea's self-determination, in favor of Crimea's accession to the Russian Federation. So this is sort of what the lay of the land is now. The real question is, what can we do? So far, we haven't done much. Uh, the real, for my money, the, the real conversation, serious conversation, begins the moment at which you can counter Russia's offer in a credible way. The Russian offer of $15 billion was so attractive to Yanukovych precisely because the Ukrainian economy was on the ropes. It still is on the ropes. The Ukrainian economy is, is a disaster. And so Europe needs to be careful for what it wishes for, which is it can invest, it can sort of suggest a pro-Western direction for Ukraine. But if Ukraine takes them up on that offer, you have a, an economic drag on the larger European economy. Um, only recently, in the last couple of days, have the Ukrainians actually said that um, you know, they, they are now going to 
uh, follow the, the Powell Doctrine, which is essentially, you know, you break it, you bought it. So uh, I I if they say that you shouldn't follow Russia, they finally, for the first time, uh, about two days ago, announced that they would provide $15 billion in aid. We are not. We've provided, we've offered $1 billion, in, $1 billion in, in loan guarantees, which is a completely different thing. And it's a signal to Europe, but also to the Ukrainians and to the Russians, that what we want is we want a, a trailing role. We don't want a leading role in the resolution of this conflict. We want the Ukrainians to step up and uh, pony up the vast majority of the money and the vast majority of the political capital to make this happen. But this doesn't mean that we don't have any cards to play. You've already seen the G G7 countries uh, all announce that they're suspending preparations for the June uh, G8 summit in Sochi. Um, you have, I mean, I, I, I try not to read The Economist because it does funny things to my blood pressure, but I couldn't help noticing that a couple of issues ago, The Economist actually called for Russia to be thrown out of the G8 outright for its aggression against Ukraine. The OECD yesterday announced that it was suspending Russian accession. And so what you see is you see a, a very active international trend line towards Russian isolation. Um, and this is coupled, uh, this is already sort of having uh, pretty significant material effects on the Russian economy. The, uh, the ruble has softened against the dollar. You've seen a pretty noticeable decline in the Russian stock market. In the MISEC, it's called the MISEC stock index. Um, you have sort of the, you have capital flight, which is already sky high, which is beginning to accelerate even further. You have a dampening of foreign direct investment, at least the presumption thereof. Um, and so there are real serious tangible economic costs to the Russians. And there are things that we can amplify through sanctions, uh, such as the ones that uh, the White House has proposed but not yet imposed, um, which would include uh, travel bans and asset freezes on select individuals, and such as the ones that the Senate is currently contemplating, which is an expansion of those designations, essentially to take the Magnitsky list, uh, which is the list, uh, uh, the targeted list of sanctions against people involved in the um, the uh, very lamentable case of uh, Russian whistleblower Sergei Magnitsky and actually make them global, apply them to uh, different circumstances. Uh, and Ukraine is a good place to start. Um, th there are certainly things we can do, and there's also tangible military things we can do um, short of putting boots on the ground, because I don't think that's really sort of in the cards in a serious way, but there are things we can do in terms of accelerating um, NATO cooperative exercises in the Black Sea, uh, accelerating discussions with the new Ukrainian government about the Partnership for Peace program, things like things that would signal that NATO hasn't forgotten about the 1994 uh, Budapest Declaration, which is when the Ukrainians, in exchange for giving up their nuclear capabilities, were provided promises for territorial sovereignty and political integrity from the United States, from the NATO countries, and even from Russia itself. Russia would make the argument that it's protecting it right now. But right now, as of right now, there is no countervailing argument from the West saying, well, actually, no, you're not, and we are. Um, and this gets me to sort of a, a good historical example for you guys to think about. Um, and I, this is sort of the other portfolio. Frank knows that I sort of spent a lot of time on. Uh, it's Iran. Um, about a year after the Islamic Revolution of 1979, the Iranian economy was in the doldrums. It was in the doldrums because the new radical ideological regime in Tehran wouldn't compromise. It wasn't seen as a uh, security producer in the Middle East. It was seen as a security uh, threat. Um, and as a result, you were, you were seeing increasing isolation on the part of uh, Iran in economic terms. And there was uh, rising inflation, there was domestic malaise, there was all sorts of uh, indicators of domestic misery. And the advisors for the Ayatollah Rahul Khomeini came to him and said, you know, we should really moderate our policies because we're beginning to feel the economic pinch. And, Rahul, uh, and Khomeini's answer was, I think, very telling. He said, we didn't stage a revolution to quibble over the price of watermelons. In which he said, you know, the revolution is an ideological construct. It is coherent. It is internally consistent. And we're not going to abandon parts of it just so that we can, you know, fare a little bit better or just so that inflation can go down. And so this is really, to my mind, the fundamental question in Russia right now, which is that there are all, there's all this external empirical data that, ru that the longer Russia persists in its Ukraine adventure, and particularly if Russia pushes further into Ukraine, the more costly it's likely to become, the more the consensus congeals about Russia's economic isolation. The real question is whether Putin understands this or he's willing to, you know, forego the price of watermelons anyway. So, I'll stop there. Ilan, thank you very much. As always, it's a, a, a treat to hear you sort of connect a lot of dots. Let me, let me ask you about one that we discussed on the show um, briefly.
the I think the thing that has been particularly striking to me about how the Russians have responded is uh, the naked use of propaganda and information control, dominance, warfare, whatever you want to call it, to present to their own public a portrait of the Ukrainians that is uh, the kind of thing that would justify the sort of repression or invasions or whatever might be coming. Um, would you talk a little bit about the 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 truth with respect to the Ukrainians and and uh, are the are the folks in the street uh, that have brought about the new orange revolution or whatever one calls it uh, fascists some of them maybe or are they basically freedom seeking people and the sort of people that we want to be very supportive of Right. Well, I, I think it's fair to say, the good starting point is to say that the picture is not as the Kremlin paints it, but it's not quite as everybody else paints it either. It, it's a very complex and very moving dynamic. Um, the, uh, there are elements, so far-right elements, in the Ukrainian opposition, to be sure. These are not the majority, uh, but, and this is sort of uh, an important but, the longer the Ukrainian body politic perceives Western inaction, the more these forces rise to the fore, the more there's a polarization of Ukrainian politics, because they'll see that the, you know, they, can only go to, they can only capture international attention when they go to extremes. So I think time works in favor of those radical fringe elements and against the moderate middle. Um, but the moderate middle has a, a pretty hard road to hoe, I think, anyway, because the, the new Ukrainian government, and the prime minister was here yesterday, um, it has to demonstrate that it's willing to do things that its predecessor was not, and do so very quickly. Economic reform, transparency, the strengthening of multilateral institutions, uh, and do so in a way when, frankly, their economy does not support them being able to do that. So it's by no means an easy lift, but the Russian image of what Ukraine looks like, or what the Ukrainian opposition looks like, is, frankly, what's known as active measures, right? During the Soviet Union, we were sort of remembered that the Russians would uh, paint a very robust information operations picture of uh, what they would like the battlefield to look like. And I think there's quite a lot of that going on. Uh, the Russian press, uh, to, into which I include uh, organs like Russia Today, which is, by the way, headquartered not so far from here, um, it, have been promoting very consistently a narrative that um, there are Russians under threat in Ukraine. Um, there are let's be clear, there are not Russians under threat in Ukraine. There are Ukrainians who see themselves as Russian who believe they're politically disenfranchised. I mean, that's a very different thing. But interestingly, the Russians uh, v very often lead the political things that do, they do with legal things that they do. So to that, uh, to that point, it was very useful last week, at the end of last week, uh, Vladimir Putin did a press huddle with Kremlin reporters and they immediately transcribed it and posted it on the website in which he talked about the fact that from the, uh, from the Kremlin's perspective, <clears throat> the February 21st Constitution, the new Ukrainian Constitution, which empowers the current government, is effectively null and void. The only Constitution that matters is the old one. And under the old one, there are only three ways to get rid of a president. He can either die, he can either step down, or he can be impeached, which is a long, drawn-out process, including uh, the Ukrainian Rada uh, Parliament. Um, and that process wasn't followed. So, ergo, he was saying, everything that has flown from that, the entire Maidan protests are essentially illegitimate and Russia is committed to restoring the status quo ante. That's an important point because it suggests that unless he meets stiff resistance, Putin is not going to be content just with Crimea. He's going to try to restore at least the political lay of the land further, maybe perhaps into eastern Ukraine or perhaps even further if there's not resistance from the West. Good. Question? Marshall? Uh, sorry. Flip a coin. Preston, you got the, you got the mic. Go ahead. My question deals with the Russian mafia, which is very much involved in the Ukraine structure and in part the in political structure as well. How are they standing on this situation? Well, well it's interesting. I <clears throat> had a couple of days ago, I had a, a conversation about this with, with a, a very strangely sort of pro-Russian Ukrainian from Kiev who, you know, sort of the, if you know the politics, it's not quite right. But... But he made the point, which I think is a good one, which is that the, the economy of Ukraine and the sort of the political structures are so corrupt that the $15 billion from the West is going to be pilfered. It's just a question of whether or not they're going to be pilfering Russian money or they're going to be pilfering European money. I think it's a good point, and that's why I made the reference I did to making sure that the Ukrainian institutions are strengthened and they're, they're much more transparent, because I think the days 
from the West where you can see an infusion of $15 billion and not expect to see where that money goes and to sort of expect a return on the investment, quite frankly, is gone. It may not be gone on the Russian side. So what you see is quite a few, although not all, of the sort of super empowered economic actors in Ukraine tend to prefer this, the status quo that existed before, in which there was a pro-Russian government. Um, it essentially allowed them to do whatever they want, and they weren't all that accountable. Um, I think that this change into a more sort of westward direction, and perhaps all, also into a more transparent direction, is going to be a threat to their interests. Preston. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ukraine was, I think, 155th on the uh, Heritage Index of Economic Indicators, and uh, I didn't read it, but Russia was 100. Really uh, Russia bad. was 147 or something. But okay, yeah, so, right. so that means they've got some really serious infrastructure problems. Absolutely. And uh, you're highlighting some of those right now. I was going to ask about about that. What chance do you think they have of overcoming that? So. This is, I think, a very serious question because it gets at what is essentially a dual conversation that we're having. One is the practicalities of, okay, let's assume that we have the political will to bring Ukraine into our orbit. What are the nuts and bolts things that we have to do in terms of rule of law, in terms of institution building that we can do? I am certainly not an expert on that. I can refer you to quite a few. But I would also make the argument that that's not the leading end of the conversation. The leading end of the conversation is the other one, which is that what happens in Ukraine sets the tone for whether or not the Russians push elsewhere. And you see this from the rhetoric coming out of Poland, coming out of Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia. They think that Ukraine is not a one-off event. They think that because of the way events in Ukraine have spun out, that Russia is uh, the um, uh, Lithuanian foreign, uh, prime minister, uh, actually said a couple of days ago, she gave an interview in which she said, you know what, um, this, Russia is a bad actor and they are trying to restore a historical presence, right? She's saying that their sovereignty, not just Ukraine's, but their sovereignty is under threat. And that to me is the, mo the more important part of the conversation to have for now. Although the second one is obviously where the rubber meets, meets the road. If we do have a sort of dis uh, consolidated, serious, significant Western uh, response to Russia and do manage to get them to think twice about pushing further into Ukraine, that's when the hard work starts because you have to make sure that those institutions aren't vulnerable in the future.